Welcome back to the Murmurations podcast. Today, my guest is Professor Karen Voljorgensen from Cardiff University. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Um, it's really nice to have Karen on today. Karen taught me as a young undergraduate student and an MA student, and I stayed at Cardiff for my PhD as well, so I've known Karen some time, and it's really nice to be talking to her today in this uh context so many years later on very nice to um, you as well darren uh thank you for coming on it's really great uh what we could we there's probably lots of things we could talk about i'm probably going to focus on um your research around journalism emotion media and politics that kind of stuff but do you want to before we get into any of that do you want to give people a brief overview of your background research and teaching interests Sure, yes. So um, I'm essentially a journalism scholar. So I've always been really interested in looking particularly at um, how journalism is produced and looking at also opportunities within journalism for ordinary people to have a voice. And one of the things that uh, started to strike me very early on in my research was the fact that uh, oftentimes when um, ordinary people do appear in the news, they often do so in ways that are quite emotional, that are based on their personal stories and personal experiences. And it, it furthermore struck me that that hasn't really tended to be reflected in scholarship. So my research um, over the course of a number of years um, eventually turned to these questions around the role of emotion in journalistic storytelling um, and kind of reclaiming the importance of looking at emotion in that in that context and so um, so I've been doing research in that general area um, covering a wide range of different topics uh, over a number of years um, and that is also something that that interests me in my teaching. So I, I teach um, two different modules as the main kind of module coordinator at Cardiff University. Uh, one is an undergraduate module called Media and Democracy, um, which uh, uh, basically looks at the relationship between the media and political institutions. And then within that, I am actually quite interested in these questions around citizenship and citizen voice and also try to sneak in stuff about emotion and populism <laughs> as well. Um, and then I also teach a master's core course uh, called Introduction to Journalism Studies, where I get to have fun introducing students to all the key research, uh, both kind of historically and also what's most exciting at the moment in the field of journalism studies. And that's a, a sort of field that I've been involved in for a very long time um, and uh, where I've most recently edited the second edition of the Handbook of Journalism Studies where I have a fine contribution from you Darren. So, so that's some of what my, <laughs> what my, uh, my, my general uh, background is in terms of my teaching and research and in fact for me both teaching and research are always really closely connected to each other so I always felt that it's quite important that you're able to do your teaching in a way that kind of um, uh, is informed by it, but also feeds into your research. Um, and so I always felt quite passionate about, about doing that. Um, so yeah, so that, that's some of what, uh, what I tend to get up to. Yeah, I think that point about uh, research-led teaching is really important. Rather than seeing research as something you want to be getting on with and teachers getting in the way, I see both of them together as... Uh, a really important uh, sort of synergy. Um, I wasn't going to ask you this, but I just kind of, I just remembered when while you were talking um, w earlier on in your research career, didn't you write some stuff about or do some research on letters to the editor at newspapers? Yes, that's right. So actually, um, this was my PhD um, <laughs> originally. So uh, I was listening in seminars. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well done, Darren. <laughs> so, so back in 1995, um, I uh, was doing my PhD at Stanford University in California. Right. And at that time, I uh, became interested in these questions around 
citizen participation um, through the media. And, and at that time really led us to the editor where the one that's the only forum for that kind of participation. And so I took to studying how editors select what letters they're going to publish right. and how they, they talk about the letters and, and the letter writers. And wow. so that was actually a kind of a really fundamental in terms of transforming my view of what is valuable in terms of, of participation precisely because even though the editors always talked about how you know they want this kind of rational deliberation in public and they want uh, informed citizens to participate when you ask them for specific examples of what kinds of letters they really liked those were stories from people about something kind of personal that had happened to them uh, like uh, going to a particular bookshop every day uh, with their daughter after school or their reflections on developments um, in, in the landscape around them. So really kind of embodied personal experiences um, that kind of reflected some perceived authentic truth um, that uh, was part of a much bigger story, um, for instance, about bookstore closures or about uh, the transformation of the landscape of the Silicon Valley. So that was actually quite seminal for me, this, this early research on letters to the editor. And now looking back on it, I think, wow, if only I had known about the internet back then, God. it would have been amazing. Yeah, it's just the way in which now it's just an instant comment on whatever you think about the story that's posted. And people even go into some stories online to see to read the comments as much as to read the story itself. Um, yeah, fascinating. Um, so more recently, you've done a book on emotions, media and politics. Do you want to talk a little bit about that book? Sure, yes. So uh, what animated that book was this uh, recognition that I talked about at the beginning that um, emotions are actually essential to mediated politics that historically we, we have intended to recognize that the emotions are there um, in everything ranging from journalistic stories to politician speeches so we have intended to recognize the importance of emotion because we've tended to privilege a very rational view of what it means to be a citizen we've tended to privilege um, a kind of view which assumes that being kind of rational and informed and sensible about politics is the foundation of good citizenship and that there's a kind of binary opposition between on the one hand rationality and on the other hand emotionality. Mm. That means that that emotion has tended to be a kind of elephant in the room or something that we have unseen quite deliberately um, in terms of our understanding of mediated politics. But what, what I argued, and, and I, I should hasten to add that I'm not alone in this, is that actually we cannot view emotions and rationality as mutually exclusive, but we have to actually recognize the fact that um, any form of political participation, any form of media content is inherently both emotional and potentially rational. And that if we start to take emotions seriously and analyze emotions, then we can make a lot more sense of what uh, we tend to see in the media and make a lot more sense as well about how people engage with media content and get fired up about causes take action and, and so on. So Absolutely. that's basically what, what animated that book. Okay. Um, and what particular political contexts do you analyze in the book? Well, um, that book um, was written in the period, uh, probably starting around 2011 and up until 2018. And one, one of the, uh, developments that I really saw happening over that time period was the rise of populism. Mm. And so 
Uh, in particular, I was very interested in the rise of Donald Trump and what kind of animated that also in emotional terms. Um, but equally, you could see it as a kind of global wave of populism uh, where you had um, populist leaders around the world that kind of shared similar tactics in terms of uh, widely relying on the negative emotions, particularly anger. So I was very interested in anger um, as a specific and important political emotion. And, I, and by the way, I'm not just looking at it, anger in, in the context of populism, but also more broadly at the role of anger, for example, in representations of protest. Yeah. Um, so, um, so although uh, my book uh, looks at several different case studies, it's basically based on, on a series of different distinctive studies of the relationship between emotions, media and politics, um, it unfolded within, within that particular political context. Okay. Um, I think as I was talking to Tony Sampson recently, who we were talking about the growing interest in affect and the affect studies as a field. And I think because of what you're saying, how emotions always been there, but it's not always been at the forefront of the analysis that's critiqued from this very sort of rationalist perspective. But do you think that the turn to pay more attention to emotion is this is one of the reasons why there's so much more interest in affect studies and how affect studies provides toolkits that are really useful for us in journalism and media research? Well, absolutely. And I think that we've seen a sort of effective turn um, across arts, humanities and social sciences yeah. over the past few decades. And so I see my work as part of that bigger picture. And if anything, I would say that probably in media studies, that has been a longer standing tradition. But in the study of things like journalism and political communication, it has been a much, much later arrival of these kinds of questions. Yeah. And I think that's particularly because both journalism as a practice and a field of research and political communication have been really very much wedded to ideals of objectivity and ideals of rationality. Mm. Whereas if you look at, at other fields like media studies, for example, uh, media studies um, has always been quite aware of, for example, you know, effective, um, effective kind of, uh, engagement on the part of the audience, like mm. in fan studies, for example. So, so we've seen more attention to um, these concepts within media studies than we have within um, the, the disciplines that I've traditionally moved around in. Um, so, so in that sense, um, I and other people who work in, in areas closely related to mine have been relatively late at coming to these kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, I think in, in critical discourse studies as well, which is, I know is another field that you've, you've had a sort of recurring interest in over the years, emotions have, have kind of always been there in, in, in almost implicitly in a lot of the analysis that's been done. And now through these kind of this affective turn, it's bringing emotion more to the forefront. One standout example for me is Wodak, uh, Ruth Wodak talking about the, uh, the, the politics of fear. And when you talk about anger, that really resonates because I think so much of the anger that we're seeing in so many different contexts is actually about fear. Um, fear is often the thing beneath all these other expressions we see on the, on the surface. So the, the collective psychology project um, that's, that's run uh, by, I think his name's Alex Evans in New York, that talks a lot about the way in which there's individual and collective crises going on where disconnection, disillusionment, feelings of um, like lacking any empowerment whatsoever and control is, is creating these things like anger and polarisation that are pulling us further apart. And I think that's both fueled by and fueling the populist uh, movements that we're seeing across the world, well, across the world, really. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about 
populism in terms of the type of stories that seem to uh, that the emotional types of stories that audiences seem to connect with the way politicians know they can tap into these kinds of stories that are popular with voters yes i mean actually before before uh, talking about that i just wanted to pick up on something that you just said or yeah. the the point that you just made because i, I think that's that's absolutely right and when, when i look back on my book um i came to reflect that actually i should have paid more attention to fear and so, in fact, what, what, what's just happened recently is that my book has been translated into Japanese. Right. And I was asked to write a preface for the Japanese translation. And so I wrote it just a few days ago. And that preface was all about fear. All oh, right. Um, okay. And um, also about the relationship between fear and anger. Because um, I, this is something that's become particularly uh, apparent to me as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and, and perhaps we can talk more about this a little bit later on um, but um, what's become really obvious is that fear like you said is closely linked to anger um, and in a sense inseparable from anger a lot of the time yeah. but it also fear is even though it's it's often an emotion that's seen as immobilizing because like literally that, you know, we can be immobilized by fear. In other ways, it also often spurs us to um, engage in activity or to experience other feelings like anger. But I think that it's really important to pay attention to the complexities of that relationship between fear and anger and to say, you know, probably we can't really even talk about anger without also talking about fear. And so this is this very question that you just brought up has been very much on my mind lately as I was uh, thinking about <laughs> what would I have done differently if I were to write, write this book now. Um, so back to, uh, back to the question that you were asking, you were, you were asking about um, kinds of stories that populist leaders uh, tap into. Yeah, it kind of overlaps really with what you're saying there, just because when we look at polarisation and fear, there's often this idea of a them and a, a them and an us, um, and we're seeing that playing out. We've seen that play out if Brexit, um, from even before the referendum, the way in which the likes of Farage made the case for a referendum. Didn't you look in the book a, a little bit about Trump? I know when you came out to Newcastle, you talked a bit yeah. about Trump. Do you want to talk about some of that? Yeah, so um, so one of the chapters in the book, uh, which is, is um, a sort of uh, rethinking of a shorter journal article that I originally did for Media, Culture and Society, um, is about what I refer to as Trump's angry populism. And when I talk about angry populism, what I mean is that he uses this rhetoric which deliberately draws on the emotion of anger as a way of almost being like a ventriloquist of the anger of his voters, many of whom feel severely disenfranchised or feel, feel that they've been kind of left without a voice for a very long time. And um, basically what, uh, what I'm drawing on there is in part work by political scientists who have uh, study what motivates Trump voters and there are many different explanations to this but many of them share this analysis that people who voted for Trump are driven by anger a lot of the time so um, so I think that uh, uh, the, the economist Anne Pettifor for example talks about patterns of economic anger where people feel they've sort of been left behind by globalization um, and there's a, a very strong kind of um, really kind of xenophobic element, therefore, in terms of being worried about the economic consequences of globalization mm. that Trump has really uh, tapped into. And then um, I think it's Pippa Norris and Friend Inglehart, who are uh, political scientists. They talk more about a form of cultural anger by which uh, they're referring to the fact that uh, in particular sort of white uh, middle-class working-class voters 
um, are concerned about the rise of multiculturalism and political correctness and so on, um, and that that creates a certain kind of divisive politics uh, which is reflected in this cultural anger. So there, there are many analyses that look at, uh, at anger as a, as a sort of underlying motivation. And, and what I argue is that actually anger is an extremely unusual emotion um, in a sense, or has historically been for politicians to draw on. Um, and, and here um, I'm relying on, on the work of the historian William Reddy, who talks about the idea of an emotional regime. And when he talks about emotional regime, he's, he's referring to this notion that, you know, if we look, let's say, back to the Middle Ages, if you look at the broad historical sweep, each particular epoch or each era is defined by a set of dominant emotions. Um, and these emotions um, uh, form the underpinning of any stable political regime, the way, the way he puts it. And so that political leaders will tend to use particular emotion words um, as a way of kind of creating a certain emotional climate in a particular era. Right. So, so what, what I argue in, in the uh, chapter on angry populism is that certainly in recent US history, we've seen the use of trope, of trope, of hope as a, as a key, I was going to say hope as a trope, uh, but hope as a key kind of uh, um, emotion word uh, underpinning the emotional regime. So things like, um, uh, Bill Clinton being the man from hope, because he literally was from hope, Arkansas, but he used that, he spun that out as much as he could. And then equally with Barack Obama, we had this iconic hope poster. But then there's a switch to Donald Trump, that who, even though his slogan is make America great again, which is a very positive slogan that embodies hope for the future. Then at the same time, his rhetoric in terms of how he presents himself and how he speaks, is frequently underpinned by anger and understood as such in terms of media representations. So I looked at the prevalence of the use of the word anger in media coverage of Trump, and I compared that to Barack Obama's first term uh, for, for a period between the actual election and, in, and inauguration, and I found that anger was far more prominent in coverage of Trump. And in the vast majority of cases, um, this anger was not particularly directed at anything. It, it was a kind of like generalized anger and frequently it was the anger of Donald Trump himself. So basically what that means is that Donald Trump in a lot of the media coverage is described as an essentially angry man. And that anger is seen to direct a lot of his policy making but also underpin the way he speaks to voters. So mm. that's the basic argument that I'm, I'm making uh, on, on the basis of an analysis of the use of um, anger as an emotion word that underpins this emotional regime of angry populism. And I, and I think Trump is not unique in embodying this. I think that, no. so, so the uh, post-colonial writer Pankaj Mishra talks about an age of anger, a global age of anger. Mm. You can see politicians like uh, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil as kind of embodying similar, uh, similar positions. So I, I don't think that Trump is unique, but he's certainly distinctive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Russell Brand was recently talking about why he thinks that Trump might actually get back in again because the way in which the media um, and even the Democrats are responding to him is that focus on him as, you know, his appearance or the, the, how he's kind of hobbling down this, the video of him hobbling down that ramp or, you know, he's just, just an angry man again. And that plays into his game because he's able to say to his kind of uh, crowds or followers or however oh look look what they're saying again look what they're focusing on again they don't really care about the real issues they don't really care about you or, or, or whatever they're just they're just reporting this same stuff and Russell Brand saying that playing him at his own game like this 
just gives him something to work with in terms of this this persona that he relies upon um, at these these rallies and stuff that he holds. Um, really interesting stuff. Do you, a moment ago you mentioned COVID. I mean, Trump in relation to COVID has been how <laughs> how a leader can say some of the things that they say and, and, and get away with it is is unbelievable. But um, is there anything you want to say about Trump in relation to COVID or do you want to talk about COVID more broadly? Because I know you've written some stuff about it. Yeah, so I mean, um, I think, um, uh, what can I say? Trump speaks for himself. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, it is, it is kind of astounding um, to look back on, you know, and this kind of naive, utopian past where a politician would be held accountable whenever they did really irresponsible stupid stuff um but trump just does stupid stuff day in and and day out and does not seem to be held accountable for it and i think that there is um i mean there's certain that there is this real possibility that the voters who went for him in 2016 will not change their minds uh, because they actually value um, that persona like you said that that he has created and that the ways in which he's also doing stupid things day in and day out almost serves to strengthen his bond with those voters um, so in fact in, in one of the other chapters in my book i look at the positive emotion of love and one of the things I look at there is people who say that they love Donald Trump on Reddit. Um, so I analyze Reddit posts from people who, who talk about loving Donald Trump. And there it's, it's very clear that the voters who love Donald Trump love him because they think that he's a regular guy. Um, it's a you common know, populist that, trait, isn't it? Yeah, so that he's a regular guy. And um, when he does stupid stuff, it's the kind of stupid stuff that all of us would do. And so there is a real appeal to, um, to this, which I think is, is difficult for, you know, over-educated, um, over-educated intellectuals like myself to understand, uh, but where it resonates quite broadly, especially with people who, um, who may not have had a lot of opportunities um, and who see, they see him as the embodiment of the American dream in a sense, so it's so it's quite fascin it's quite fascinating to see how how that uh, kind of stupidity uh, or performed stupidity works uh, for Trump. Um, now, moving on to uh, to the topic of the coronavirus pandemic, which um, I think is safe to say that that it's on everyone's minds at the moment and has been for some time. Um, that is obviously something that has massively been preoccupying me and also has been very relevant to think about in the context of emotions. And in fact, um, I started following news about this weird outbreak in Wuhan, China, way back in January. And I started following it because I just read a very scary novel about a Chinese um, uh, kind of, um, what was it? There was a Chinese fungal infection which very rapidly killed off 99.9% .9 of the entire world population. Um, one that's called the Shen Fever. The novel's called Severance, by the way, and it's highly recommended and very, very creepy. But because I just read that book, I paid a lot of attention to news about this outbreak in Wuhan and began to follow it quite closely when the outbreak appeared to be quite difficult to contain. And so I ended up writing what was probably one of the first uh, pieces of analysis of media coverage of the coronavirus in the conversation. And in that piece I wrote, it was actually published on Valentine's Day on February the 14th. So in that piece, I, um, I made the case that a lot of the coverage in Britain at the time was uh, quite sensationalist and quite fear inducing um, and I, I sort of tried to look at specific examples of this this coverage and the ways in which it induced fear make, making the claim that 
you know, in the face of uncertainty, there tends to be a lot of speculation. Um, and that speculation often involves worst case scenarios. Now, as it turns out, <laughs> the worst case scenarios have uh, played out in ways that were not even imaginable at mm -hmm. that time. And so, um, so what, what that means is that as a result of that, the coverage actually changed and became in some ways less fear inducing as it was more about, you know, how do we deal with the daily reality of the lockdown? Um, you know, very practical, uh, practical things about the disastrous situation that we have found ourselves in for the last uh, three months or so. And so it's been fascinating for me uh, to follow this coverage. Um, and um, I think that, I, I mean, I'd, I think that obviously if I'd, I'd known what would happen back in February, um, I would have uh, possibly written certain things a little bit differently. But I think that the main uh, point that I was making there and around the, the role of fear as a contagious emotion mm. and one that actually spreads quite rapidly, possibly more rapidly than the virus itself, that that um, really stands. And that I think that it's important to think about the importance of fear as an emotion, also in the context actually of how we deal with the pandemic going forward because the virus is not going away and the fear is not going away. And therefore we have to think very carefully, not just about the management of the virus itself, but also about the management of the emotions that come along with that. Mm. I think the, what you're saying about fear as well is that way in which there, there, there was an element of early on with the press uh, covering it in the way they were it was just another thing it was that we're constantly fed stories of fear all the time there's this group to fear there's this circumstance to fear there's these things to constantly fear and almost um always anxiety inducing or or, or um divided us up into conflict or fear in other people or for, for whatever reasons and this was just was almost an, an, an just another story um so when things did start to escalate it kind of reinforced the point that maybe we should have a public discourse and a, a more common media discourse that if there is something to be alarmed about we're told for good reason that it's something to be alarmed about rather than it just being another thing on the long list that we're told to be fearful of every day um that's really fascinating. I'm aware of time, um, and I like to try and keep things tight, tight with time. But before we go, uh, since I started doing speaking to people for this this podcast, one thing that's just um, recurred is the the broader conversation about current times being challenging for academics, but particularly the uncertainty for people who are maybe early career researchers or PhD students. Uh, and I just, people who, who come on to chat to me really, I just like to give them a chance to talk about any research networks that you're part of or um, any kind of collective initiatives in the field that you think are particularly supportive and collaborative for um, PhDs and early career researchers. So is there anything you're involved in that you, you just want to talk about in that respect before we finish? Uh, well, I um, I have one top tip, which is um, that, uh, well, actually, probably two. Okay, so the first yeah. thing I would say um, is that in my in my job as director of research in in the school where I work in at Cardiff University, um, I, I sent out an email very early on in the lockdown saying. You know, right now, what you need to focus on is your own well-being and your family. Mm. And the last thing that anybody's going to be looking at is whether there's some kind of little publication hiatus or a little bit of a delay in production um, around 2021. Um, everyone has been affected by this um, in very varying different ways. Um, 
many of which we don't even know yet. Um, yes. So, um, so the first thing I would say is that as researchers, we should try to be as supportive as we can to each other, and that we, as and as individuals, I think we should also really take care not to put undue pressure on ourselves in terms of getting putting stuff out there or thinking yeah. this person managed to do this. Why didn't I manage to do yeah, that? Yeah. The fact is that this is a, a horrendous crisis for everyone and we're all going to be affected. The second thing I would say is that at this time, um, it can be very difficult to focus on writing. It can be very difficult to focus on self-care. And what I've done in the past is that with a couple of colleagues, um, I've tended to, this is before the pandemic, we, we got together every week to do uh, what's called a Pomodoro writing. So writing right. according to the Pomodoro technique, uh, which basically is a technique where you do writing intensively for 25 minutes, then you take a five minute break, you do four uh, of those 25 minute sessions, and then you ah. have a break where you have lunch and you chat and whatever. Now, um, that proved to be tremendously productive and helpful uh, to me and got um, a lot of writing done for myself and my colleagues. Um, and I would really strongly uh, uh, urge everyone to form a virtual Pomodoro group. Brilliant. Uh, with uh, colleagues, they don't even have to be in the same field. They don't have to work on anything related to what you're doing, but just to have that kind of support network and to have a dedicated space where you do get together and you do write, but you also have that kind of social support. So that would be my one tip. Um, make sure that you have these networks or um, try to set them up in small groups so that you've still kind of get a sense of regaining control yeah. and then um, and then don't don't be don't be hard on yourself this absolutely this is not the right time to be hard on yourself be kind to yeah. yourself um as much as you can and i think i think the being keeping connected is key there as well so just the keeping or or uh, re-establishing connection and that was the main reason i started this podcast really was because with everything going on at work um with you know, getting students through to graduate this year and getting everything prepared for what's going to be a very different year next year. Um, there isn't, there was no, there is no realistic time to get much writing done for me. And I thought, well, if I can just protect, you know, one, one hour a week even, um, and that's enough to get one of these conversations done, then um, it's just that feeling of, of staying connected and having conversations and, just talking really and, and sharing with people. So um, yeah, thank you very much for chatting. It's really nice to see you again. It's really nice and, to see you, Aaron, and it's a lovely idea. Um, and um, uh, I'm really, really glad that you're doing it. Thanks very much. And thanks for coming on. Uh, um, this will be available fairly soon. So I hope people enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.